Yes, it's John G. Sutton, Tales from the Jails. Somebody sent a message and said, why don't I look directly into the camera? Well, the camera's up there and my head is down here. Yes, yeah, so unless I lift my head up there, I can't look directly into the camera. Can I, can I look now? You are under my control. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit today about Max Clifford. Yeah, Max Clifford and Freddie Starr. Yeah, I knew Freddie Starr because he's from Liverpool, you see, which is just down the road from me a piece. And uh, I knew Freddie Starr in 1967, 68, before he became uh, a single act. He was a pop singer and he had a group called the Delmonts. I think he originally, I think it was the Moonlight, Freddie Starr and the Moonlighters or something like that. But it, eventually he had a group called the Delmonts. And I saw Freddie Starr with the Delmonts. He used to do, <coughs> his act consisted of impersonations of Elvis Presley. And he even did an impersonation of PJ Proby. Yeah, you know who PJ Proby is? Well, this is one of the records I released. Hey, yeah. P.J. Proby. That's P.J. Proby there with his split trousers on stage in 1965. Well, <clears throat> Freddie Starr used to do that now. I know that Freddie Starr was into uh, <clears throat> girls. Know that about that. He was into girls when I knew him. Basically, I only knew him through the clubs. You know, as you know, I used to do some work on the doors <clears throat> in the clubs, and Freddie Starr was one of the acts. He's notorious for young ladies, not specifically 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds. That was more P.J. Provis thing. <clears throat> but Freddie Starr used to like young girls. And uh, we have a mutual friend in London who lives near Milton Keynes. And uh, he had, at the time when Freddie Starr was a big name in the 70s, uh, a large detached property there with uh, a swimming pool. And uh, he was telling me Freddie Starr used to, he was a mate with Freddie Starr, he used to go and stay there for a few nights. And at the bottom of the swimming pool, Freddie Starr used to get this uh, aqua lung, sit down at the bottom of the swimming pool with this sub aqua lung and pretend to read books at the bottom of the pond because all the neighbours could see in. And there's Freddie Starr sat at the pond, bottom of the pool pretending to read a book. And there was always young ladies around, and it was guaranteed that Freddie would be upstairs uh, helping himself to the sweeties. That's what it is. And another one of his mates uh, happened to be, as you know, Max Clifford. Yeah, now Max Clifford ended up getting himself imprisoned for various uh, sexual indiscretions. And uh, Freddie Starr used to go to his office, and I know a story about going into his office one day. <clears throat> and uh, Max Clifford had uh, a lady in there, and he said to, apparently he said to Freddie Starr, uh, my secretary is coming in in a minute, and walked this completely naked young lady. Freddie Starr enjoyed that a great deal, I believe. But he was uh, fixated on his anus. Did you know that, Freddie Starr? I mean, I know he was not charged. He was subsequently found to have no case to answer. <clears throat> but I know a lot about Freddie Starr. He used to defecate into people's uh, dressing rooms. So if you're on a, a theatre tour with him, you're guaranteed you somewhere along the line you're going to meet with Freddie Starr's rectum. <clears throat> Seriously. He, go in, he went into uh, Engelbert Umperdinck's dressing room and crapped into his uh, wardrobe, into his shoes. Defecated all over it, defecation, shite, you know, all over the place. He was on tour with the Hollies once, seriously, and he got one of the Hollies guitars, the rhythm guitars, yeah, acoustic guitars, unstrung it so that the sound box in the middle was open, defecated into the guitar, crapped all inside it, then restrung the guitar and put the guitar back in where it was. So that when the Hollies went on stage, picked the guitar up, what the bloody hell's that? Freddie Starr. Hmm? Anyway, he's gone now. Very funny guy. Very difficult to work with. A lot of people would not work with Freddie Starr because he was uh, extremely crazy and he was guaranteed to do something. 
that would deeply upset people like shit all over them. Seriously. <clears throat> I worked with uh, Tommy Cooper, you know. And Tommy Cooper, he, he was very funny. Then we got locked up. Uh, oh, unless he got lifted for being drunk and disorderly, but not that I ever knew of. But uh, Tommy Cooper used to drink a bottle of gin, and it was G Gordon's gin he used to drink, a bottle of Gordon's gin, before he went on stage. Seriously. He had a bottle in his hand, a glass, a glug, 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 down the neck, yeah? And he'd stand off stage with the microphone, and he'd be going, yeah, say this is the microphone, and he'd be going, Ha 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 Glug 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 down his neck Oh, oh, oh. well the audience were in absolute They were in thralls of laughter Before he went on stage and he'd do his act And he'd get a massive standing ovation Come off, then he'd do another bottle of vodka <clears throat> I was with him for a week when I was the, uh, the doorman at the club called Blighty's in Manchester. It was a big nightclub, a bit, a bit like uh, the Batley Club, you know, the Batley nightclub. Well, Blighty's was one of them kind of clubs, you know, where they had big names on. And uh, Tommy Cooper was one of them. At the end of the week, I'd been with him all week, you know, I had to stop people getting anywhere near him, which was easy. I mean, I never had any problem with that. I never had to lay a hand on anybody doing that. I just used to go, no, no. And that was it. They did back off. I don't know. Maybe I looked a little bit aggressive. I certainly didn't mean to. Anyway, uh, at the end of the week, Tommy Cooper said, uh, I said, uh, great, what up, you know, very nice, you know. Yeah, have, a drink, have a drink, have a drink on me. And he put something in my top pocket. In my, I had a, evening jacket on, you know, and he put this thing in my top pocket, and I thought, oh, that's, that's probably give me a tenner or something like that, no, I, he hadn't, what do you think, come on, what do you think Tommy Cooper had given me as a tip, a tea bag, that's what he'd given me, seriously, anyway, <clears throat> we're talking about high profile prisoners in prison, I mean, Max Clifford, he didn't do any much bird in in the hard hard bird, you know, he didn't do a hard time. He got switched to an open prison. I think he was at Lay Hill, actually. Uh, and uh, that's an open prison near Bristol. Uh, quite cushy time there, you know. I mean, just so long as you don't try and run away, because if you run away from a place like that, then you get banged up back to the Scrubs or Parkhurst or Wandsworth or Pentonville. One of the old uh, dumps, you know, so you don't want that. So basically, he just did his bird in there, but he dropped dead, didn't he? <laughs> Max Clifford. Another one in there, in, in Lay Hill, <coughs> was uh, <coughs> Rolf Harris. Now, I believe Rolf Harris uh, was working in the, in the shops, the workshops, but he did a lot of drawings for the staff. You know, he was... I like Ross, Rolf Harris. I mean, I was very surprised and disturbed to discover that he was, in effect, entertaining himself like many of the others with little girls. As I say, when I worked with PJ Proby, uh, he was uh, associating himself with an 11-year-old girl. Now, at that time, he tried to uh, introduce me to what he called his future wife, an 11-year-old girl, and uh, I reported the child as being at risk and the social services took action and she was never seen again around him. <clears throat> of course, that destroyed my working relationship with PJ Proby because I wasn't allowing it to happen. Whereas, uh, generally speaking, you know, road managers, recording managers, personal managers, they facilitated all this nonsense. But... Seriously, could you do that? You say, oh yeah, that's all right, Jim, you know, get on with it. No, you can't do that. You've got to take action, yeah? Anyway, I took action. And uh, the, the jails are full of people like that, relatively high-profile people, businessmen who have been associating themselves with little girls, little boys, priests who are into, into, into young men. I mean, seriously, <coughs> my grand, my uncle, my dad's brother, 
Martin was telling me when he was about 11 years old, they were, they were Catholic, you see. They were in the choir and, and the Catholic priests uh, used to give them sixpence if, they, if the, the boy's sixpence, if, if they would allow him to fondle their buttocks, which my uncle and my father didn't do, but they were still offered this sixpence. Yeah, I mean, they're dirty perverts. <coughs> Seriously. I mean, once you, if you get that as a little boy, it, it must damage you for the rest of your life. I don't know, maybe I was just an ugly bastard, but nobody approached me like that. Seriously, they didn't. did when I was about 15. I was walking home from... Uh, <coughs> I used to work at a cinema as a odd job man doing the boilers and cleaning the place up and assisting with the trays. And One day, they, uh, they were short of staff. And they said, John, will you do it for us? You know, somebody's got to do uh, the, 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 the tray, you know. So it came on at the interval, you know. And now, you know, remember that, the old uh, things with the lights come on at the front. They say, and now, from the girl with the tray, and a big light, beam of light came down, and it was me with a tray on. And, and the place was full, and it was uproarious laughter, yeah. Made me feel all right, funny. But as a special treat, I'm going to sing you a song now, which is a song that I liked when I was a young man. Still don't mind it, you know. I'm going to kill it for you, though. It's obviously in need of some torture. And Miss Zed, yeah? Are you ready? Have you got your rock and roll shoes on? Because here we go with All Shook Up. Oh, well, bless my soul, what's wrong with me? I'm itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. My friends say, John, you're wild as a bug. I'm in love. Yeah, I'm all shook up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm all shook up. Well, my hands are shaking and my knees are weak. I can't seem to stand on my own two feet. Who do you think would have such luck? I'm in love. I'm all shook up. Uh-huh, huh, as I always think, yeah, yeah, well, please don't ask me what's uh, on my mind, I'm a little mixed up, but I feel fine, when I'm near that girl that I love best, my heart beats so it scares me to death, I think that's enough, I think we've killed it, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of today's Tales from the Jails. Do subscribe. There'll be more. I want to talk about uh, people pissing in the soup tomorrow. That's a treat, isn't it? Pea soup.